if you want to turn with me quickly, if you want to, but keep your finger in Acts, we are going to come back to that. Joel chapter 2, I just want to show you something. Joel chapter 2. One of those great moments have just happened where the speaker can't remember where... I know it's in the Old Testament. Don't say that, please. I know, I know it's near the end. Thank you, Pastor David. Yeah, I know, I know. Do you know, I hate this. I'm always like this when it comes... <laughs> Why am I looking? It's here on my page anyway. Why am I bothering? In Joel chapter 2. <laughs> I know it's in. I know. But these things happen sometimes. You ever try and find the book of James in the New Testament? I know exactly where it is. But I'm always very like, oh, come on. And I always rush past it and rush back beyond. Anyway, there you go. Joel chapter 2. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Pastor David. Yes, I clearly have a... A slight uh, issue with Jay, except for my wife Joy. I thank you. Right. I will survive the end of the day. Right. Let us not forget Peter's first sermon. We have much to learn from the first church's preach. Associate Pastor Warren takes us on a journey through speech and spirit with the much glossed over Sermon of the Apostle Peter. Reason I'm not opening these prayers is because we've been praying already. For those who may be now watching this on the internet, um, you weren't here this morning, or even for those that have only just arrived, you'll note, and the cameras hopefully will pan and note this, that it doesn't look quite normal. The chairs are not exactly in a nice neat row. It's all a bit higgledy-piggledy. That's because we've already this morning had significant time of God speaking to people, God moving. We've had everybody else interacting with everybody else. It's, uh, as it was quite eloquently put by John, the Holy Spirit in one person was communicating with the Holy Spirit in another person. And we've seen that been going on. And I hope to get a resounding yes right now. Yes. So this is why to give you a context, because it is Pentecost. It is Pentecost Sunday. This is the allocated, the birth of the church. So it's happy birthday to all of us. Are you all exhausted from earlier on? You should be refreshed as well. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Where else would we be looking on Pentecost, yes? But it is so, so easy to get caught up in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. It's so easy to get caught up in the moment that the sound like wind and what they seem to see were tongues of fire separating. So easy to get caught in that and really, really get fired up and talk about it, yes? But we've already been there this morning already. So we're now into Peter's speech. Peter explaining what has happened. That's what we're going to do. But a quick update first. It was in Acts 1. Jesus told the disciples, about 120 probably this way, to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. And that promised Holy Spirit will empower you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, yes? To be witnesses. And that was our motto, Acts 1-8, for two years. But let's just read Acts 2, 1-13, to just to give us just a bit of context, even though we have experienced it this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. That means their own mother tongue, quite literally. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And I want us to take note of verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Pentecost is not a Christian term. Pentecost is actually a term that reverted is for a Jewish festival. There were three major festivals that were needed to be held, uh, according to Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. And one of those is Pentecost, commonly known as Feast of Weeks. And it also happens to be a time of thanksgiving for the harvest of the crops. So Pentecost is not necessarily a term that refers to Acts chapter 2. It existed way before then. But it almost got reinterpreted here at this moment. Now for me, one of the things that gets me, you saw, or there was this image of a sound like the blowing of the wind. I mean, when Luke wrote this, he probably didn't quite know how else to describe it to you. It wasn't like a, a wind came rushing through. He said it was a sound. He was trying to explain what had happened. And then there's a great instant foreign language educational moment where people just had the Spirit fill them, and they were able to talk and say and talk about the wonders of God in people's own native language, a language they hadn't previously sat in class and studied. Anybody at school now? I bet you would love to have that moment, just in the moment of an exam, yes? Lord, I don't know my French. Help. But there was a reason for this. It was to actually not, not to pass an exam. But it was God showing something through the Spirit. That actually at this moment today, what Jesus is about, when he sent the Spirit, was breaking down barriers. Somebody quite rightly said yesterday, they could have spoken in Greek. Greek was the common language. And actually, there was a lot of Jews there from different countries, and they would have known Aramaic. And really, the vast majority could have heard it in Aramaic as well. But it wasn't. God said, no, everybody here needs to know that I have broken down all relational, societal, and cultural barriers so everybody can hear it in their mother tongue. Hear the wonders of God in their mother tongue. I think God was saying there is not one language that is primary. There is not one language that is the God language or the hyper-religious language. Every language I, the Lord, have put out there because it is who you are. And therefore then, my lang that language I've given you that you've born in and you've grown up with, you can use to spread the wonders of me. I know we are in England, but believe you me, England is not English, is not God's language. It is one of many right across the board and is even. When the Spirit came, it broke down all barriers. Everybody is included if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So there is this wonderment going on. People they knew that shouldn't know their mother tongue. It's just not possible. Yet they were speaking it. An amazing wonder. Could you imagine being in that moment where God is speaking through people into other people's lives? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that? Hello? I know it's going to get 24 degrees. I'm sitting in a 50 
50% wool suit at the moment. All right? So I'm sweating. Be with me. Could you imagine that moment where God comes and, and the Spirit is moving amongst all his people and they're all talking to each other? There's prophecy going on, maybe. Prayer going on. People speaking into people's lives. There's no way you knew that. Oh, oh, that did happen, didn't it? When? This morning. Yes. Excellent. That did happen. Yet, we see in verse 13, there were some that just made fun of it. There were some who just didn't get it. So instead of just saying, I don't quite understand what's going on. I'd like somebody to explain. They decided they needed to ridicule it and make fun of it. They were stubbornly and ignorantly unmoved by the power of God working in and through what was going on. I'm going to be honest with you. There is a word that constantly, every time I want to refer to these characters, that they were taking the... And then the problem is, I can't use that word really in church as a Christian, but it it, it is there. It's sitting with me all the time, every time I think about them. I don't know why, but I won't use it, but I'll leave it to your imagination. It's unusual for me, but that really is sitting with me. I really want to say it, but I won't. Maybe some here of delicate, which I don't blame you. So if it does slip out, forgive me in advance. Anyway, they were taking the mick, the whatever. They were being rude about it. They, they just didn't understand it. And I just can't believe that. So what happens is, if I trip, don't worry about it. Um, we then go into 14 to 21. Let's read that together just for a moment. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter stood up with the eleven. Peter Peter, who denied knowing Jesus in front of a servant girl. Bear with us. We know the end of this story. 3,000 got saved. Yeah? Gave their lives to Jesus. We know at the end of Peter's speech, 3,000 got saved. And it's not just at the end of Peter's speech. There's more there, and we'll come to that later. But 3,000 got saved. So how many actually were there? And it was only the men they counted, by the way. Sorry, ladies. My sisters. I know. I'm glad we're not in that society now. You know, we're not meant to be anyway. Moving on. But if only 3,000 got counted as saved, how many were there that did not give their lives to Christ? So Peter, and I want you to get this, Peter, who denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed, in front of a servant girl, stands up in front of thousands to explain what's just happened. Two things from this. One, even if you make a mistake and you screw up, and where you should be standing for Christ and you don't, and you deny him or you shy away or you swallow up, gulp and get nervous, as with Jesus did with Peter at the beach when he cooked him breakfast, he can be, you can be redeemed and restored in that, in asking for forgiveness, and you'll be reused. It's not like mischance, 
you will get used again in a different context. But also I know here where G Peter could have got away with it and just said to one girl in a crowd, yeah, yeah, I know this Jesus. He then had to stand up in front of thousands. So if you're feeling like you've messed up completely and God can't use you again, that is not true. He does restore you and he will still continue to use you. Second thing, Peter, if you look at the story of him following Jesus to the, into the courtyards and denying that servant girl at the time of Jesus' arrest, he thought he could do it all on his own. I, Peter, fisherman, battle the seas. I am a tough man. I can do it all. That's the sort of character he was. No, even if all deny you, my Lord, I will not deny you. Little servant girl, you know Jesus. No, I don't. You can imagine the context. Big, burly Peter, fisherman, hauling in hundreds of fish in nets with other men. Calloused hands, servant girl. You know Jesus. He becomes as timid as a mouse. Because he tried to be all on his own. This is what got me with this verse. Then Peter stood up. With the 11. Now I know it's 12 and we could talk about 12 tribes of Israel representation. But I think there's more to that than this. He stood and he's here unfortunately is just brothers. But his brothers stood with him. They were supporting and encouraging. Do you know why? Because they were now part of God's household. <gasps> oh isn't that our motto? He stood because they were part of God's household now. And that was part of that process of standing and being encouraging with each other. So allowing the one to do the talking, but still needing the other to support in prayer and to be there. It's part of being God's household. It's part of being gifted in different formats in different ways. As John quite rightly said this morning, just because there's somebody at the front doing the talking doesn't mean they're the only ones who actually hear from God. But it's just the way that that person is gifted. So me standing here, I'm gifted to speak at the front. I hope you agree with that. Good, thank you very much. But I can't do that without the support and prayer support of God's household. Nor can Pastor David. Nor anybody that speaks at the front. And for me, this was the key thing. Peter stood up, but the other 11 were with him. He was no longer autonomous Pete, individualistic minded Peter. He realized he needed the rest of God's household. And this is partly what this is about this year. We need each other. We're interdependent on each other. And we saw that and experienced that already this morning, didn't we? When we're all praying for each other, connecting with each other, doing things with each other. Wasn't John leading from the front and him prophesying everybody or praying for everybody or just speaking words of encouragement? And I realised I just used the word just speaking word. I missed that. Remove the just. Speaking words of encouragement. It's all equal. Do apologise. That is all of us doing that. That's part of God's household. And if you're disconnected from God's household... You will end up like Peter, that the minute a servant girl comes up to you and says, you know Jesus, you'll crash and burn. It's a lot to get out of one verse, isn't there? So take hold that we all need each other. I know we live in a society that says you're meant to stand on your own, you're meant to do it all by yourself, look after A number one, and all of that stuff. Baloney. And I want to use a stronger word than that. But you get the point. By the way, you do actually realise um, there are actually swear words in the Bible, don't you? It's just that we've shrunk them down. We've nicely smoothed them over. If you look at some of the words that were used in Greek by Paul, it's actually very, very strong. Very, very strong. And if you want to talk to me about that later on, I'm quite happy to do so. Not that I'm advocating swearing, okay? We're meant to live clean and holy lives. So, we are meant to support each other. 
So Peter stands up, and no education in this, other than spending three years with Jesus, and he knows the Torah quite well, but then suddenly realizes any else need to interpret. So not only did this gift of the Holy Spirit come out and actually pour out different languages, speaking the wonders of God, but it also gave Peter the gift of inter- trying to interpret what was going on. Through him was the power of speech to start explaining. So if you don't think you know your Bible that well to unpack it with people, if you've read it, God will sometimes, when you're put in front of people, empower you to help people interpret it. But you do need to know it as well. I had some uh, Latter-day Saints come and knock on my door recently. Wonderful guys, fantastic. I'm in my shorts and my T-shirt. There's an image for you. And the first words were, as I opened the door, I went, hi. Um, first thing you need to know, gentlemen, before we start, I'm a Baptist minister. I said, that's fine. I said, great. So we then spent the next 25 minutes or so talking. And it was fantastic time. And I didn't have everything immediately to mind. I could, but it was great to listen to them and then listen to me. And I felt God pouring out because I know that Joy was praying for me in the background. She really was. But that's part of God's household. Needing somebody else to do that for you. And, you know, that interpretation was going on and I could... I didn't understand too much about Latter-day Saints and some of their stuff. But as I was listening to God, I knew where God wanted me to go with the conversation. Do you understand? And it's not because I'm educated in it. It's because I had to listen to God. And we can all do that. Because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm distracting and that's fine. Verse 15. So here we are. Here is it to our... um, how supposedly comical set that Peter now needs to explain to them. Uh, These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, isn't that ridiculous? There's all these men speaking in different languages that they've never learned before, and they would know that. They're clearly legible. They're clearly understandable. I don't know if you've ever really spoken to a truly drunk person. But sometimes they don't really make sense, even in their own language. And no, we're not going back to my history. Thank you. Okay, but... So to think they're drunk is quite amazing. And it's only nine in the morning. There's no way at nine o'clock in the morning, St. Peter, would this be happening? They can't be drunk. Mind you, 2,000 years on, Peter may not be living in Greenford. But back then, that just didn't happen. And actually, do you know, Peter's almost being sarcastic to them as well. It's almost like, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Come on. There's something else going on here. Don't take the mick. Don't be rude about this. There is something quite amazing going on. Just because it doesn't fit into your mindset right now, just because it doesn't fit your set plans, don't make fun of it. Maybe learn. Do not be ignorant. Be learning. So, Peter needs to interpret what's going on. He interprets it by this. He looks at the Old Testament prophet Joel. Joel 2, verses 28 to 38. We're not going to look at it now. And he reinterprets it into the context of what's happening now. Now, Joel is disputed about roughly when Joel was actually written, but the common plan is it's probably about, about 800 BC. Awfully long time from when it happened. But, you know, but either way, it's a few hundred years before it happened. So Peter says, in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In the original Joel, if you want to turn with me quickly, if you want to, but keep your finger in Acts, we are going to come back to that. Joel chapter 2, I just want to show you something. Joel chapter 2. One of those great moments have just happened, where the speaker can't remember where, I know it's in the Old Testament, don't say that please. I know, I know it's near the end, thank you Pastor David. 
Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, I hate this. I'm always like this when it comes. <laughs> Why am I looking? It's here on my page anyway. Why am I bothering? In Joel chapter 2. <laughs> I know it's in, I know. But these things happen sometimes. You ever try and find the book of James in the New Testament? I know exactly where it is. But I'm always very, oh, come on. And I always rush past it and rush back beyond. Anyway, there you go. Joel chapter 2. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor David. Yes, I clearly have a, a slight uh, issue with Jay. Except for my wife, Joy. <laughs> I thank you. Right. I will survive the end of the day. Right. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, you will see it says afterward. The word afterward hopefully should be in there for most people. Yeah, afterwards. It's where God is speaking, where through Joel, he is saying, afterwards, I will pour out my spirit. And this is after a time of judgment upon the nations, a time that he's pulled back the people of Jerusalem, uh, of Israel, back to Yahweh. And it's saying afterwards, and I will do this. And this is very much a far gone prophecy. This is seeing somewhere into the future, which is happening here. But Peter, you will notice, says, in the last days, God says, there's a change. This one moment, Peter needs to say, now, this is what Joel is talking about. It's in the last days. And we are in the last days. Amen? Amen. And we have been for the last 2,000 years. Oh, yeah, we don't like that because we like to hear that we're in the last days like, oh, it's only been happening for the last 50 years. It hasn't. It's been happening since this moment. Well, it's actually been happening since the day that Jesus was born. We're in the last days. So Peter's reinterpreting it. He's saying that my people, I will pour out a spirit on them. I will pour out a spirit of prophecy. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. For the Jews in Jesus' time, the key thing they were waiting for, to know that God was at work and it was the final sort of act of judgment. God was working in releasing his people. God was coming and sending his, his sort of the Messiah, the Savior and all of that was this moment in Joel. They recognized that at some point they were looking for the Holy Spirit, a spirit of prophecy. A spirit was going to be pouring out prophecy and it was going to be on all flesh. Because in Joel, it's on all people. In the Old Testament, prophets were just a selected few. I mean, there were schools of prophecy, but I'm not going to go. But a selected few. But to have God say on all people, I'm going to pour out my spirit. That's what they were waiting for. They knew this was the moment. This was the day of the Lord when that was happening. And they're waiting for a spirit of prophecy. And this is what happened in Acts 2. So therefore then, if you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, you have the spirit of prophecy in you. Now, let's explain something, because that doesn't quite cohere with the fact that we do recognize in the New Testament, the New Testament make it right, quite rightly that there are those who will be just prophets. There is a specific gift of the prophet, still, even in New Testament times. It's almost like their main gift is prophet. Liz would come under that tag. But it's main gift. Doesn't mean that nobody else cannot prophesy. We've seen that already happening today, yes? Because prophecy is just a nice big umbrella word, which you, when you narrow it down, there's we sometimes, oh, words of knowledge. Well, how's that particularly any different? It is slightly different. But there are those that their gift is a big prophecy. So I want to explain this. How do we tag up the fact that there are some that are given specifically the gift, a main gift of being a prophet? And yet here, God is saying, out on all people, the spirit of prophecy. Well, what was an Old Testament prophet's job to do? Their job was to make known God. An Old Testament prophet's role was to make God's will known. It was to communicate on behalf of God and say, this is what God wants. Thus says the Lord. 
Normally it involved, thus says the Lord, you're going to be in trouble unless you repent. But it was to make God's will known. But there was a point coming that even in the Old Testament, in what they would class as the new covenant days, when a new covenant would be created through Jeremiah 31, 34, they understood this Jesus moment would happen. They didn't understand it in the form of Jesus, but they understood a new covenant was coming when it would be universally known that God needed to be known universally. It would no longer be just stuck within Israel, with his Israelites. It was to be that God would be known universally. So if an Old Testament prophet's job was to make God known and God's will known, in a universal context, it's everybody's role. If you're in the New Covenant, it's everybody's role to know, make God known. Yes? Do you understand that with me? So actually, effectively, you're all prophets. Because your job is to make God known to everyone. Equally, as it says in 1 Peter, you're all royal priests, yes? But there are some that are called specifically into full-time ministry. I put inverted comma priests, but you're with me, yeah? But we're all royal priests. So therefore then, you are all prophets. Because you're all meant to make God known. And this is what this means by the spirit of prophecy. Because the Holy Spirit indwells each and every single one of... Correct. You got that, yeah? Wonderful. Now go out and make God universally known in the power of the Spirit. So these Mickey takers didn't get what was going on. But you have all got the Spirit poured out in you. Not to be used on here on a Sunday morning, though that is also the case. But it's actually to make God universally known. Notice that, universally. It is not shrunk just to your little area it's wherever God puts you you are to make God universally known happy so far just come back to this unpacking something I think we haven't got yet verse 18 even on my servants both men and women I will pour out my spirit even on my servants both men and women that was like unheard of what, the women as well? But it's again God showing how he breaks down gender barriers, social barriers, barriers that should never be there in the first place. He's saying, no, everyone. Everyone will be gifted. There is no separation. Everyone. There is no division in Christ. So that means every single one of us are included. Every single one of us have the opportunity to be part of God's Household. Six months now we've had this motto up there. God's household. No separation, no barriers. I don't care where you've come from, you can be part of God's household. Don't care what you've done. This is proof that you can be part of God's household. Verses 19 to 20. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Now, Peter could have left before verse 19 and left it at that, and they will prophesy. And that sounds all warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? Spirit of God's come down and we've all got gifts. That's fantastic. But he needs to finish off with the interpretation. This is the day of the Lord reference. This from Joel's time was an Old Testament reference to the time of God's judgment upon all nations. All nations. A cosmic event. And it's going to happen. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. 
We all say, come Lord Jesus, come, don't we? We can't wait for the day of our Jesus to come. But it will come with not only us inheriting something, but also with judgment coming. I know we don't like that whole language of judgment. We like to just talk about God's love and his mercy and his compassion, which is true, but he's also a God of balance. He's a God of justice. There has to be balance. I'm not talking yin and yang here, but there has to be a balance. There has to be a moment that he has to say, yes, but I have to judge as well. And this language that's used in Joel that that Peter then uses is that sort of day of judgment language, that day of when God acts, it's going to be like this. doesn't mean it's going to be exactly this, but it's going to be, it's that sort of nothing's going to stop it. It's going to be not very pleasant. It is going to be chaotic. But it's just language that is used to understand God at work. And he's also saying there will be no escape. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. There is no escape. Nobody can hide from it. And those who take the mickey out of it will suffer judgment. Now, Verse 21 says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, let's unpack that for a minute, because if you're a Jew and you're listening to Peter unpack this, at this moment, you're thinking, great, I'm saved. I'm part of the Jewish nation. Not a problem. When you hear this language, you think, we're okay, I'm saved, I'm part of the Jewish nation, it's not a problem. I'm actually part of the Jewish nation by birth. So automatically, I inherit the blessings of God. That is their thinking. If you're born a Jew, you've inherited God's blessings. You haven't got to do anything other than be part of God's nation. Be part of God's household. That's the Jewish thinking. And maybe Peter was nicely reinforcing that for them. When you call on the name of the Lord. Ah, oh, great. I call on the name of Yahweh. I go to the temple. Look, I'm at this Pentecost feast. I'm a good Jew. My family are good Jews. I have a heritage of Jews. We're okay. We're safe. Sometimes I think that may be some of us are thinking as Christians. My family are Christians. My partner is a Christian. So I'm safe. By osmosis, I'm fine. I don't need to actually make a full commitment. I can rely upon my partner or my parents or even my child's Christianity. They bring enough faith into the, uh, into the home. I don't need to do that. Their faith will be enough to save me as well. Those that call on the name of the Lord. It's at this point, Peter is now going to unpack what he means by Lord. 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. So, men of Israel... He's talking to, listen to this. I'm now going to unpack with you. Because you imagine you're a Jew, I'm safe. Cool, saved. I haven't got to worry about this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God, by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. As you yourselves know. You thousands of people... You saw, and you know this Jesus. You saw the miracles he did. You saw the signs and wonders he did. You know what happened 50 days ago when he died on the cross. You were there. You've seen it all. And I'm telling you, this Jesus was accredited by God. Okay, that's a game changer in one breath. 
We always sometimes believe when we read this story, I bet you, and I know I did, and I bet you're the same, that you felt Peter's speech were to people that didn't know Jesus beforehand. But when you read those three words, you yourselves know, they knew Jesus, they seen it happen. And he's talking to the people that have made fun as well. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Oh, breathe. Okay, this was God's plan for this Jesus to die on that cross. That's okay. Yahweh's will was being done there. That's, I can breathe now. But with the help of wicked men, yeah, those Romans did it, not us. Put him to death by nailing me on the cross. No, go back. Set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You. You put him up there. You did it. All you thousands before me now, you did it. But remember, please, again, this is shy Peter, servant girl, crumbles. At that point, it's just accused his fellow Israelites of crucifying Jesus of Nazareth, who was accredited by Yahweh. That's bold speech. Only comes from empowerment of the Holy Spirit, but standing with his brothers and now sisters who are part of God's household. You put him to death. Now, generations on, there's this sense that we say, oh, well, you know, that can't be leveled at us anymore, that we put Jesus on that cross. I wouldn't be walking with the wicked men doing that. Oh, yes, I would. Because what happened, these people went along with the crowd. They went along with what the religious leaders of the time were saying was the right thing to do. They got caught up in the swathe of, we need to get this man crucified because we think he's going to usurp power and there was a whole load of things. It had nothing to do with him being the Messiah. It had to do with power and politics. You went along with the crowd. You might as well put the nails in his hands yourselves. Oh, it was God's purpose. But God knew what he was doing at the right time and he knew people at the right moment. These thousands would have been the ones that stood there shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And now they're just being told, by the way, he was accredited by God. You're seeing the proof of that now by the spirit of prophecy being poured out amongst you. How would you have felt at that moment? Picture yourself there just for a minute, if you can. You're seeing these great wonders going on. You could be somebody also just making fun of it because you don't understand. And you know you were there in that crowd 50 days ago shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And now God is saying, uh, Peter is saying, but Yahweh accredited him by signs and miracles and wonders. And I'm reinterpreting what I mean by Lord from the Old Testament prophet Joel. And he interprets it by going on, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it is, was impossible for death to keep its hold of him. I still find those words amazing. It was impossible for death to keep hold of our Lord Jesus. And then he uses uh, from King David. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because he will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter is just interpreting what he sees, what we now class as the Old Testament, and applying it to today, which is what we do here with the Bible all the time, don't we? We take it and we try and apply it to today. We understand what went then, and we apply it to today. I just want to keep going, because I don't want to unpack it all. Brothers, he's talking to the fellow men. He's just accused them, by the way, of crucifying Jesus. 
So you did this. You went along with the crowd. And he says, brothers, fellow Jews, I tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is there to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Talking with his fellows, disciples with him. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit that has poured out what you now see and hear. Now, just imagine you're a Jew right now and you've just had what you consider to be Lord has just been completely reinterpreted for you. You crucified the Lord. And the proof is the Spirit being poured out amongst you right now. Why are you taking... Why are you poking fun at this? For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Taking Psalm 110 of David, The Lord said to my Lord, Do you talk to any Jewish theologian at the moment? They still don't fully understand that passage. Because it actually makes God to be more than one in their heads. And we understand the Trinity, God three in one, one in three. But the Lord said Sit to my Lord. So this will be Lord Father said to my Lord the Son. Come and sit at my right hand. David prophesied that. And this is when they just believed that God was just literally one. Yahweh was one. I mean, he is still one, but he has three persons. If you don't understand that, come to one of my theological evenings. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. My world at that point would have just been shattered, I think. So I've just interpreted you who, what I mean now by Lord. Where it says this great judgment day is coming, this spirit of prophecy will come out, but there will be judgment, and all those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not calling on the name of Yahweh, it's calling on the name Lord Jesus. Birthright means nothing. Birthright as a Jew means nothing anymore. Because we've just seen all the barriers have just been broken down. All the culture's just been broken down. God has made it very, very clear that everybody can be included in the household of God. It does not mean you get in by birthright. Must have been an amazing speech. Imagine doing a theological paper on this. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They've just had their entire world turned upside down. They have just suddenly realized that they don't naturally inherit. Yahweh isn't just going to let them in just because fleshly they were born and men at the day, age of eight days old you had it snipped. That is not enough. Being born into a Christian household is not enough. Being married to a Christian is not enough. Having one of your children as a Christian is not enough. Enough. 
So how did Peter respond? What should you do? Repent and be baptized every one of you in name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. If you're here this morning, he's calling you. If you committed to him 20 years ago, he's still calling for you to keep walking. Repent and be baptized. Do you know, actually, that was humiliating for a Jew to be told to be baptized. It's actually embarrassing for them. Because it was only the Gentile converts to Judaism that actually got baptized. They had to cleanse themselves whenever they wanted to ascend a hill in Jerusalem uh, to go up to the top to, 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 to pure heart and clean hands. But to actually be baptized... That was humiliating. That was offensive to him. Only Gentiles got baptized. So if you think getting baptized is humiliating or embarrassing or something here, it's not. It's quite easy. It's quite simple. For a Jew, that was almost borderline offensive. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. With many other words and wardens. So this speech wasn't the only one and only speech. This wasn't the only moment. And then 3,000 gave their lives to Jesus. They carried on pleading with them. Probably walked around and spoke to them. Said, you know, give your life to Jesus. Let me explain something more to you. Ran Junior is safe. It's okay. We know that. But that's what he would have done. There would be more pleading going on. More talking going on. But there's a point that they had to respond there was a point that they had to be baptised. To become part of members of God's household, they had to respond. Peter is saying, repent, turn from. Now, sometimes repentance is seen as, um, oh, literally having to completely, oh, I don't know, totally empty yourself in some strange way, in some really forgiving, literally making yourself feel like a worm. Repentance is about just turning around from what you're doing, from the lifestyle you're leading and turning towards Jesus. Saying, I want to do what you want me to do. To me, the modern day version is turn your life around from this corrupt lifestyle. Leave your household of consumerism and its fickle members who only want to spend time with you when you've got money. But repent, turn around and become part of God's household. It's quite easy, says he, who took three years to make that decision. Peter's speech is saying, just turn around and get baptized. It's not hard. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to, added to their number that day. I'd like to see 3,000 added to this church in that day. I don't know where we're going to house everyone. But Peter said that speech emboldened, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter was a fisherman. The scriptures were unpacked for him that he knew, but they were unpacked for him by the Holy Spirit as he engaged in the conversation. He interpreted the times. He started to understand what God was at. And Peter still didn't get it, because we know later on in Acts, he didn't understand really that Gentiles were fully included as well. It took some time for him to get that point. But we're all included. But you've got to repent and all be baptised. But what fascinates me is the power is at work. Miraculous signs were going on. And still, there were people who poked fun at it. There were people who took them... People took the urine out of it. Seriously, we laugh, but it's true. It goes to prove that powers and signs and wonders do not make a Christian, do not make people commit their lives to Christ. It's actually more the power of speech and actually loving and interpreting it for people. You laugh and you smirk, but honestly, there's worse language out there. I bet there's worse language in here in some of our homes as well. But there are people that will always take the mick of what they do not understand. And there are people who 
will not commit their lives to Christ. They think they've got time. They've got time. The urgency to be told that you haven't got the time is quite important. These are the last days. You could walk out of here today and be hit by a bus. Or whatever. But today is the day for a sense for me of urgency of actually helping people understand the gospel. And actually just telling them the gospel. Peter didn't do anything but just told them the good news. That's all he did. He didn't think up some special method. He just stood with his brothers and interpreted what was happening. Today, something's happened. Do not walk out of here and just then dump it and park it. Today, something really happened. And it wasn't because John is special. John just facilitated the moment. We all did it. Yes? We all did it in the power of the Spirit. So we can all be Peters or Peteresses or Petras. That's a good one. And go out there and tell people the gospel. Tell your friends, tell your family. Empowered by the Spirit. Don't sit there denying it. And it doesn't have to be by signs and miracles. It can be just by talking. Because when the words come from your mouth, the Spirit makes them do something. And if you're still in this room, and you've still not repented, you've still not been baptised, you've still not committed your life to Christ to become part of God's household, you're still relying upon some other osmosis way of knowing it, today is your day. Please, like they were doing when they were pleading and imploring them, doing the same, stop putting it off. Let's pray. Father, I do just pray that each of us, we take from this morning the experience, be it large, be it big, be it small, the experience of knowing that you used us this morning. We know, Lord, that was by the Holy Spirit in us connecting. We ask you help us to connect with the spirits of those people who do not know you yet. Help us to open our mouths, be emboldened to explain your good news in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.